Dr. Day has been working for 20 years by now in environmental justice, energy justice, energy poverty, and also energy and environmental transitions. Um, so yesterday, uh, we already um, had the pleasure to discuss in depth uh, some of Dr. Day's work in our research group here at Filetas in Karlsruhe. And um, one of the papers that I want to especially mention uh, that reflects uh, Dr. Day's work and that we also discussed yesterday is her 2016 paper, Conceptualizing Energy Use and Energy Poverty Using a Capabilities Framework. And I think that that paper, um, yeah, that paper applies the conceptual resources of the capabilities approach to the issue of energy poverty and nicely connects to um, many of the things that people here at Philetas are working on. So uh, that goes for the philosophical theory side with the capabilities approach, as well as uh, for the topic of energy more generally. Um, Dr. Day has also worked on several interdisciplinary and international projects and uh, collaborated with engineers, natural scientists, historians, and literature scholars, among others. So Dr. Day's work is also very much uh, yeah, in, in the same spirit as, was, uh, as what we are trying to do here at the uh, Institute of Technology Assessment and Science um, here in Karlsruhe. Um, yeah, currently Dr. Day is working on a large project called Energy Solidarity in Latin America, which involves collaboration with academics in Mexico, Colombia, and Cuba. Um, and she's also part of a Horizon 2020 project called Community Energy for Energy Solidarity. Yeah, okay. So in the name of the whole Philetas group, thank you for being with us here today, Rosie. And let me also say that we are very much looking forward uh, to your talk. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Aika. And it, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to Philetas for the for the invitation and for all of the generous hosting so far. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. And is that all okay? You can see everything and hear me okay? Okay, great. So I will start. So what I'm going to talk about today, as, as Ike has already introduced, um, is how we're thinking about energy poverty and energy vulnerability through a capabilities lens. So there's kind of two, two parts to my talk, really. For the first part, I'm going to talk through the basics of the theory. Um, so a little recap of the theory and how we are thinking about this conceptually in terms of um, applying it to energy poverty. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to go on to some applications, so some ways that we've tried to use this approach in practice, which is challenging. I think many of us know the critiques of the capabilities approach of it being um, rather difficult to operationalize. So hopefully some, something interesting there in terms of the results that, that we've got and, and how that's helped us think about energy poverty, but also perhaps in terms of the ways that we've mobilized things methodologically. And then hopefully some plenty of things there for some interesting discussion afterwards. So starting with some of the concepts then, so I'm starting by talking a bit about energy poverty, what we mean by that, and the standard approaches to energy poverty so far. So what we tend to see in research and policy applications about energy poverty. So in high income countries, generally, um, energy poverty is approached of in terms of affordability of energy. So the problem being households not being able to afford enough energy. And there's also been quite a big focus on people's ability to heat their homes, um, probably partly because this concept really originated in the UK. And when the climate of the UK, heating is a big issue. And this also tends to be heating tends to be the biggest energy expense for households as well. So really, in high income countries, energy poverty has tended to mean affordable heat. Although, obviously, when we when we go out of northern Europe, then other energy services like cooling become very important as well. But when we look at energy poverty in low and middle income countries and what the concept means there, the same term is used, energy poverty, but here it's usually taken to mean access to modern energy. So modern energy would be usually electricity and also clean cooking fuels. 
Um, sometimes it's taken to mean access to a specific quantity of energy, so a sufficiency of energy. And occasionally it's used in terms of access to energy service, but, but usually it's about this access paradigm in low and middle income countries. So I think there are some limitations with these standard approaches. Um, so first of all, clearly they're making quite general and quite inflexible assumptions about energy needs, kind of one size fits all, um, whether that's in terms of the amount of energy that's needed or specific energy services that are important, like, um, like heating, as I mentioned. Um, a lot of these approaches, they, they reify energy, so that means they take energy itself as the focus rather than what we actually want to do with energy. Um, in terms of scale, they're usually assessing energy poverty at household scale, so in terms of household ability to heat their homes and so on. Um, and then there's a lack of coherence between the approaches in higher income countries and low and middle income countries, as I was just alluding to on the previous slide, despite the same terms being used. And then despite being conceptualized as a form of poverty and a hindrance to development, there's actually historically been quite a weak connection between concepts of energy poverty and wider concepts of poverty and development. So these are some of the issues that we were trying to address really when we were turning to the capability approach. And this also came out of work that we were doing on energy justice a few years ago. So when I was collaborating with, especially with collaborators in Lancaster, um, but also other collaborators in Europe. Um, so what we were really interested in doing here was exploring the application of alternative theories of justice in relation to energy consumption and energy demand and in relation to energy poverty. So I'm going to briefly explain a bit about the capability approach in more general terms first, just for people who aren't familiar with it. And then I'll move on shortly to how we can apply that in relation to energy. So as you probably know, the capability approach is based primarily on the work of the March Sen, the Indian Nobel Prize winning economist and American philosopher Martha Nussbaum. And it was put forward as an approach to thinking about economic and social development. And it arose really out of a critique of dominant methods, especially those that were based on income or GDP, very resource focused approaches, which are quite standard work, but also as a critique of utility approaches that might focus on how satisfied or happy people are. So as well as an approach to economic and social development, it's also an approach to social justice as well. And the idea is that well-being and justice and development and poverty should all be assessed not in terms of money or income or happiness, but in terms of capabilities, which are the substantive freedoms that people have to do or be what they value. So at the heart of the approach, there are these two concepts of functionings and capabilities that I'll just quickly define. So functions have been referred to as valued beings and doings. So they might be states of being, like being in good health, or they might be things that we value doing, such as having relationships. And then a capability is the opportunity to engage in functioning if you want to. So whilst a functioning might be being in good health, then the equivalent capability would be the opportunity to maintain good health. Or to give another example, having a family can be seen as a functioning if you have a family, whilst the ability to the ability and freedom to have a family if you choose to do so is a capability. So this is an important distinction between functionings and capabilities. So because it's a liberal approach, it focuses on people having the choice to do or be things that they want to do. So capabilities are therefore freedoms to put it in sense terms. So we want people to have multiple opportunities, but then it's up to them which opportunities they want to take up into pra in practice and convert into active functionings. So what's the advantage then of thinking about well-being and development and justice in terms of capabilities? Well, I think the most important shift really is that it means that we're focusing on outcomes rather than inputs. So we're focusing on what people can do rather than what they have. And then this means importantly that it can recognize that people might need different levels of resources in order to get to the same outcome. Or to put it another way, if you give everyone the same level of resources, you'll probably get unequal outcomes in terms of what people can actually do. 
And this might be because of personal attributes, such as people's age or gender or their physical characteristics. It could be because of the physical and material environment, such as the climate that they live in, whether they live in an urban or a rural place, the infrastructures around them. Or it could be because of different social environments and contexts. Another important feature of the approach is that it's a multidimensional approach. So it's interested in a whole range of capabilities and functionings that are important for people's functioning. So it's not just a basic needs approach that's focused on the minimum resources or the minimum opportunities that people need. It's about what people need in order to have a flourishing and dignified life. And as I've already mentioned, the emphasis is on capabilities rather than functioning. So opportunities that people have rather than prescribing that they need to live in a particular kind of way. So if it's helpful, some people like diagrams. I think this, this diagram might help to understand the basic idea. So on the left here, we have resources here. So resources typically in poverty research might focus on resources like money or income. But then in this approach, we see that these resources enable capabilities. So the things that people can do. But those, that relationship between resources and capabilities is mediated by these conversion factors. So individual conversion factors like gender and physical abilities, but also social and material conversion factors that I mentioned earlier. And then people can, if they choose to, convert these capabilities into functionings that this is up to personal choice and preference. So these collection of capabilities that people have is their capability set. And generally, capability, the bigger the capability set, the better. We prefer people to have bigger capability sets because it means more well-being in terms of the opportunities that they have to flourish. And it means more freedoms. So another feature of the capabilities approach is that the unit of analysis is the individual. So it focuses on the capabilities that individuals have. And I think that this is important. This is the advantage of this is that it can show up inequalities, for example, according to gender. And it can pay attention to the differential needs between different individuals, for example, according to gender and age and so on. And I think this focus on the individual has led to some criticisms of the approach for being overly individualistic. But I think that the system understood the approach doesn't necessarily mean that all capabilities and functionings are something that individuals can do on their own. So if you think about it, quite a lot of capabilities are by definition something that requires collective action. For example, the capability to have relationships or the capability to engage in community life. These are capabilities that require you know, several people. They're not, they're not something that can just be done by an individual acting alone. And it's also the case that most capabilities require some kind of social or institutional or political action. So people can't necessarily provide the capabilities themselves. So to put it another way, the approach doesn't mean that individuals are responsible for their own capabilities. So it's really about where we analyse capabilities and our interest in making sure that all individuals have adequate capability sets. Okay, so having done that brief, brief recap of, of the basics of capability theory, what I want to do now is to move on to energy applications and what are the implications and advantages of thinking about energy poverty, energy justice, and so on through the capability lens. Well, I mean, clearly what the advantage is here is that it would lead us to focus on what we need energy for, so the outcome, rather than energy itself, which we would see as the resource. So... It recognizes that energy is connected to all kinds of outcomes. Because of this multidimensionality of the theory, we can see that energy is connected to, okay, people keeping warm or keeping cool, but also to all kinds of other outcomes and things that people might want to do in their lives. And then for the reasons that I just explained in the previous slide, because it focuses on outcomes and not just inputs, the approach has this built-in recognition that different people might need different amounts of energy, in order to reach similar outcomes. So again, depending on their individual characteristics, their circumstances and their, their local context and norms. And it also doesn't make any a priori assumptions about what energy services are needed in any given context. And then again, following on from what I was just talking about, because it assesses capabilities at the level of individual person, 
not the household. This is another difference from standard approaches to energy poverty that generally focus on the household. So this has the advantage that we can consider whether energy poverty might be different according to intra-household issues. So it might be different according to gender, for example, or generation. So again, maybe a diagram is helpful here. So this, this is the diagram. It's, it's a slightly different version of the diagram that's in our 2016 paper. But just to explain this a bit, it's designed to help to unpack this relationship between energy, energy services and capabilities. So starting over here at the left, we have an energy source of some kind, whether it's a fossil fuel, renewable energy, biomass and so on. Based on that, we can derive a domestic energy supply by one means or another. And then from energy supply, what we're usually interested in is energy services. So we use this energy supply to produce energy services such as lighting and refrigeration and so on. But what's different in the capabilities approach to energy is that rather than stopping here with energy services, we are then seeing that what we actually want to use energy services for is to be able to do certain things. So we might want to be able to wash our clothes, we want to be able to keep warm, we want to access information, we want to be able to talk to our relatives on the phone. And then we want to do those things, we can go a step further even and see that we do those things because we want to reach valued states like being healthy, maintaining relationships, being educated, having a good standing in the community and so on. So these, it's important to create these, these steps are all dynamic. So these are all mediated steps and version factors associated with them. So we can see that when we go from fuel to, to energy services, these relationships depend on efficiencies of various kinds, efficiencies of infrastructures and efficiencies of appliances and buildings. So that's fairly familiar territory that most energy poverty work would be interested in. We might be interested in interventions like increasing efficiency, insulating buildings and so on. But by introducing these steps here, we can, and by separating these factors out, we can also see that there are conversion factors, mediating factors in these relationships here. So the amount of energy services that people might need to reach capabilities might depend on their context and individual circumstances. And then we can also see that between these sets of what we've called the secondary capabilities and the more basic ones, that this will depend on things like social norms and social practices. So for example, the amount of times that you might need to wash your clothes in order to be considered a normal person and to have social respect. That can vary over time. It might vary from place to place. It's quite a, um, a kind of social normative factor. Um, again, the amount of accessing information that you might need to access services is going to depend on your social and economic context. So different ways in which we can think about interventions and contingencies in these gaps here. So I meant to say, actually, I should have said that these, these are all capabilities here, but we've made a distinction between what we've called the secondary capabilities here and the more essential capabilities, with the essential ones being the ones where you, you, know, you can't kind of go any further. They're the real fundamental basic point of why we want to do things. So this diagram that was in the paper, it, it is a simplification. And um, we can also start to complicate it by introducing other feedbacks. So we can, if we think about it, we can see that when you have certain capabilities, this might also help you to access energy, in fact. So there's, there's some feedbacks between capabilities and the ability to access energy, the ability to access energy services. And also, there are quite complicated relationships between different kinds of capabilities. So once you have some capabilities, you're more able to do other things and so on. So there are, there are the ways in which these sort of connect in, in, in kind of webs of capabilities. But this is hopefully a useful diagram to sort of think about these steps and how they relate to each other and what some of the gaps, what's in some of the gaps between them. So having thought all of this through about how energy relates to capabilities, this led us on to this definition of energy poverty in capabilities terms. So we define this as energy poverty being an inability to realize essential capabilities as a direct or indirect result of insufficient access to affordable, reliable and safe energy services and taking into account available reasonable alternative means of realizing these capabilities. 
So this, it reflects the notion of poverty as capability deprivation. What we've done is put energy poverty in terms of capability deprivation. So in this case, energy poverty is capability deprivation that's a result of inadequate energy services. So we've acknowledged that the energy services need to be there in terms of access, but this isn't just about access. We've acknowledged that they need to be affordable. So this reflects the affordability aspect of other energy poverty definitions. We've also acknowledged that energy access needs to be reliable. So again, the energy services need to be not just there, but they need to be continuously and securely reliably there. They also need to be safe in terms of, for example, electrical safety, but also not causing too much pollution, not compromising people's physical safety if they use them. Um, and this last part, taking into account available reasonable alternative means. So what we're getting at there is that we would only see people as being in energy poverty if their essential capabilities are compromised from insufficient energy services and there's no reasonable non-energy using alternative way to support those capabilities. So for example, we would accept an argument that if someone we wouldn't accept an argument that someone was in energy poverty because they couldn't maintain a healthy level of warmth in their house because they wanted to just wear a t-shirt at all times. Because a reasonable alternative means of realizing that capability of keeping warm and being healthy would be to wear more clothes, right? But we would, at the same time, we wouldn't expect people to wear a thick winter coat inside their house because that wouldn't really be considered a reasonable alternative means of keeping warm and realizing that capability. But this, this kind of space of thinking about alternatives can become important when we're thinking about ways of substituting for energy and thinking about other ways of realizing capabilities without necessarily being so reliant on energy. So this does lead on to a further important question. So built into that definition is this issue of compromising essential capabilities. So capabilities can be many different things, but they're not necessarily all equally important. So we might be concerned about people's capability to be healthy. We, we probably would be concerned about people's capability to be healthy, but we're perhaps not so concerned about their capability to go skiing or, or to keep tropical fish. So how do we decide which capabilities are the essential ones of the ones that we really need to worry about? And there's really two main approaches here, which you'll know if you know the literature on capabilities and the Nussbaum approach and the same approach. So the first approach that we might consider using is the more theoretical approach, which is the, the approach after Martha Nussbaum style. And that is to take a more theoretical approach to construct a list of essential capabilities. So this style of approach led Martha Nussbaum to construct her list of what she calls the central capabilities. So she famously came up with this list of 10 central capabilities which she sees as forming the basis of a flourishing life. So this list of capabilities are meant to be capabilities that are incommensurable, so none of them can be um, substituted with another, they're non-substitutable and incommensurable. So they have diverse philosophical reference points from Marx to Aristotle. And she felt that they were capabilities that most people would be able to agree on regardless of other leanings such as their political leanings or religious views. So she saw this as a list that could have broad overlapping consensus. And Nussbaum also thought of these things, these capabilities as things that could be seen as rights. So they could be the basis of rights-based arguments. And they should be things that states, arguably states should ensure, should be in place for every citizen. So one way that we might think about energy poverty, therefore, using this list is deficiencies in any of these capabilities as a result of a deficiency of energy services. So the other approach, as I mentioned, is the approach that Sen more often argues for in his writing. And that is actually not to a priori define a list of essential capabilities, but that the capabilities to focus on should be defined through deliberation and in the context of any given project. So, so he's unclear actually on the specifics of how to do this and any of us who've worked with deliberative methods know that that's really not straightforward, but 
nevertheless, that, this is the recommendation. And this deliberative approach, it might involve disagreement, it might involve some conflict, and this would all need to be resolved through deliberation, because the aim would be to come up with an agreed list that was there was broad consensus on within that social context. And then that list could then be operationalized as the basis for assessments of capability deprivation or capability sufficiency or diagnosing where the problems are. So I think one important thing to point out here is that both of these approaches actually involve some kind of collective agreement, although in different ways, whether it's through theoretical means and drawing on theory that's been more collectively agreed on and suggested through scholarship, or whether it's through deliberation. So it's not a totally individualized endeavor. It's not a matter of each individual actually coming up with different capability sets. There is some collectivity behind these ideas. Okay, so that, that's really the, the first part of the talk completed. And what I want to do for the rest of, of the talk is to talk through some ways in which we've tried to mobilize the capability approach in more empirical work that we've been doing. Um, and I've got, if I've got time, I've got three examples um, with quite international scope. So the first example that I want to talk through is um, work from Mexico. And these examples all take slightly different methodological approaches as well. So the methodological approach from this example is primary data collection using focus groups, using discussion groups. And this was work that was done, it was a relatively small project that was funded by the Newton Foundation, the UK Newton Foundation, in collaboration with um, the government research funding agency, Mexico Conocyt. And it's a case study, as geographers, we like to do case studies a lot. It's a case study in a town called Tlamacazapa in Mexico, in, in Guerrero province here, um, not too far from Mexico City, um, a little bit south, Acapulco is down here, not quite on the map. So that's where we are. Um, so Shlama Kazapa is a, a town, really. They call it a village, but it, it's a town. It's about 5,000 people or 1,100 households. Um, it consists of three neighborhoods, which is quite important to understand there. Each neighborhood is centered on a church, which is, is kind of the focal point of that neighborhood. But the town then has a, a town center, which has the mayor's office. It has a health center. There's also a primary school and on the edge of the town there's a secondary school. Um, in terms of the, the socio-demographics of the population, it's, it's a relatively poor town and there's a high level of indigeneity as well. So quite a lot of people, um, quite a high percentage identify as indigenous. Um, some but not all of the population speak Nauta, which is the, the, the local language that goes back to the Aztecs in fact. Um, so actually the town is electrified as you can see here. Um, so it, it does have access to clean energy in that sense. It would count as not being energy poor in that basic metric of energy poverty. Um, but at the same time, affordability is an issue. And um, quite a lot of people can't afford to use a lot of energy and reliability is certainly an issue. So quite regular um, blackouts, like quite regular cuts in energy services. And um, there's paved roads to some extent in the town. These are just some photographs from around the town. So in the central area, there's some paved roads, not particularly good quality, but a lot of the town um, doesn't have paved roads. Um, just some um, pictures from inside some of the houses there. So you can see that people, despite having electricity connections in terms of cooking fuel, people are not using clean cooking fuel on the whole. A few people did have gas cookers or microwave cookers, which they didn't use very often because they're expensive and often more for show really. Um, but you can see typical three stone fire here using wood as the main fuel. And again here, this is for cooking tortillas. Um, so typically using biomass. Also issues actually with water. Um, and this is connected with energy because the water is pumped from a lower level. Um, so there is a natural spring here, but as you can see when we visited, it was dried up, which it quite often is. Um, it's also a spring that's accessed by animals, and there's some issues with pollution in the groundwater as well. So people would use this water when they're able to get it, they would use it for washing and cooking perhaps, but not for drinking. Um, most people actually bought drinking water one way or another. Um, this is a water supply outside the town. This is a small pond that's used for washing clothes, and you can see it's, it's extremely polluted. So as well as their energy, people were worried about their water supply as well. 
And so this was an interdisciplinary project. Our research team is our collaborators in Mexico, who are from the Institute of Electrical Engineering in Cuernavaca, um, and other collaborators from Britain. This is a bit of colleague looking very English there in the sun. Um, so these are mostly engineers, and then some of us are social scientists to, to, to create this interdisciplinary project. So in terms of, of what we did with the um, in the village, we convened some discussion groups and we divided them by age and generation. So we had four discussion groups, older women, younger women, older men and younger men. And that this is quite typical. We would often do this in all kinds of work, actually. It's, it's quite useful to separate by gender because the kinds of things that people will talk about tend to be quite different when they're in single gender groups. And also in terms of energy services, uh, among other things, there can be differences in generations in terms of how people use energy and what they want to use it for. So hence we separated along the um, generational dimension as well. Um, so the focus groups met in one of the public buildings and annex of the mayor's office. And we had local facilitators that were actually matched. So we had a man facilitator in the men's groups, women facilitated in the women's groups and so on. And as the basis of the discussions, we used a, a kind of version of NISPAN's capabilities list, but we um, we kind of adapted that. So we did this beforehand. Partly, it was really a pragmatic choice um, based on the time that we had to work with people and what was considered to be a reasonable amount of time that we could spend in the discussion groups. So we didn't try to work in a bottom-up way to define important capabilities. We adapted NISPAN's list to think in terms of how energy might relate to capabilities. So we discussed around these topics. Um, so some of the adaptations here, we introduced this one that, about earning a living. Um, it, it's kind of similar in some ways to what NISPAN meant about the control of the environment capability, but we put it in more concrete terms because we knew that this would be really important to people's social and economic development. Um, and we use prompts, obviously, to make the more abstract capabilities a bit more specific. So we ask people about education, religious practices, being creative, relationships. Um, prompts about how energy might relate to dignity and self-respect. Um, we took political participation out, although it could have been interesting to discuss, but um, our local collaborators thought that that would be a bit too sensitive in that context, so we didn't try to discuss that one. But what we did in the discussion groups was to, we discussed with people how energy currently links with their life in these areas. So what the relation was between these things and energy and their current situation. But also if they had more energy, how they would like to use that energy to improve their situation. Because what the project was actually really interested in was actually using this to design appropriate interventions. We also attempted some prioritization at the end of the discussion in terms of where people would want to see future improvements, um, which wasn't 100% successful, but I'll, I'll mention that again in a moment. So based on those discussions, what we did analytically was to map these relationships between energy services and secondary capabilities and the central capability or the essential capability, if you like. So we didn't do this in the groups. I think it's important to say the groups were a bit more freer discussion, as I mentioned, about how people use energy and what their current situation is like and what they would like it to be like. But these diagrams are, are, are our analysis. And, and what I've done here is I've used these. Um, so you can see here, yes, the, the capabilities, the secondary capabilities in the energy services. And then we've used the sort of classic traffic light colors to indicate where the relationships are okay. So the green arrows are where the relationship is actually quite secure and not problematic. The red relationships are where there's clearly a problem and it's having a quite severe effect on the essential capability. And the orange ones are where there's vulnerabilities. So it's, it's limited, it's, it's not terrible, but it's also not great. Um, so I'm not gonna talk through all of these diagrams in detail, but just to give some examples. So. If we start with this capability of maintaining health, then from the discussions, we could see that what people felt they needed for this that was also related to energy, related to being able to drink water, clean water, clean air, obviously food, health information, storing medicines, having exercise and sleeping. And then these related to the energy services in, in these ways. So if we, if we think about, if we look at drinking water, for example, 
This would need mechanical power because their water's pumped. But because of the affordability issues and the limited times in which this could work, they were limited in their ability to obtain clean water. And this had some impact on their ability to maintain health. But because they could buy water, they could buy clean water, the impact was, was limited. It, it's not as terrible as it could be. Um, looking at cooking, so because as you saw though, people are cooking with biomass, so they were very clear, especially the women, not surprisingly, talked at length about the impacts of this. And this was a very bad relationship. So the, the way that they did cooking had a very negative impact on their ability to breathe clean air, and that had a severe impact on their health. That was clear. But cooking in terms of their ability to prepare nutritious food wasn't a problem. They could, they could cook perfectly well in that way, and that did not compromise their health. Um, refrigeration was fine for storing medicine at the clinic because the clinic had a fridge, but refrigeration was a problem for some people at home because they didn't have fridges. And there's actually quite high levels of diabetes in the population. So the number of people were needing to store insulin at home, but they couldn't do that easily. They were using ice and flasks and that was quite expensive. So that was a limiting factor and the vulnerability for some impacts of health and so on. Um, so moving on to some others, um, physical security. The big issue here was lighting. And um, people felt that because of the lack of street lighting, they couldn't walk safely at night, and that was a problem for their, for their security. Um, actually, mostly not in terms of personal attacks, so they weren't so worried about mugging and so on. It was mostly about actually falling on the uneven roads and also being worried about dogs and snakes. So, so these were the kinds of issues that they had with poor lighting. Also, they were prone to, with collecting firewood, sometimes people would, would fall or trip or they might injure themselves with cutting instruments. So that was an issue there, which was a limitation. Um, being able to make a living, lots of compromise, lots of not ideal relationships there. So women talked about how they would have liked to be able to start food related enterprises and you know, start small shops where they could sell snacks and things. Um, because of their limited refrigeration and their limited mechanical and appliance power, then they really couldn't do this. Um, they could cook a bit, but they couldn't, they didn't have the ability to scale up their cooking to be able to make businesses which meant that they couldn't make the living that they wanted to be able to make. Um, everyone actually, all most of the families, it was really common that they made handicrafts. So they, they made handicrafts out of palm leaves and they're quite, they're dyed in quite bright colors. They're really attractive, but that process requires hot water. So their, apparently their ability to heat water was limited, meaning that their handicraft businesses were limited. So limited ability to make a living there. And they would have really liked more mechanical power, such as sewing machines, so that they could actually more quickly make these handicrafts and they could make them in a more standardised way that they'd then be able to sell to more outlets, such as supermarkets and tourist shops, which currently they can't do, sadly, because they're too, um, they're too variable. And they also would have liked to run training workshops for young people currently not able to do that. Um, maintaining relationships, I think you know, some of these are not surprising. The lack of lighting meant that women couldn't visit family, even nearby family, in the evenings when they had some free time. I think one thing here, which was perhaps unexpected, unless you know the community well, that it emerged from our discussions that social events based around the church are really important for community cohesion and for community relationships. So the, the churches are really important hubs, obviously, for religious practice, but as well as the church building itself, they have um, quite big church grounds and they would be the place where fiestas happened, there'd be lots of communal cooking, there'd be music. All of these things require energy. Um, so the unreliability of energy was a problem here. There'd recently been a, a fiesta which they'd been really looking forward to and then the energy had cut and everything was over. That, that had been cancelled, so that was a problem. Um, but yeah, the lack of mechanical power to, to be able to use appliances to cook and, and do music and so on was a problem. So all of these things were impacting their ability to have relationships with others and relationships in the community. And for young people, they were quite frustrated at their inability to, to be able to engage in social networking. So I think I'll skip through these because it's more of the same, but you can you can listen to the paper if you're interested. In terms of community priorities, this is this is what we tried to discuss with people. But it was a, people, I think what happened in the groups is that people were not so comfortable about contradicting each other. So when somebody made a suggestion, everybody tended to agree with it. 
So we didn't quite have the debate about priorities that we would like, but it was clear, not surprisingly, health was a top priority in terms of what people wanted to address, followed by security, earning a living and relationships. Um, they did perceive water as their greatest need, but as, as I mentioned, this is quite a complicated situation because the water is also polluted. Um, so that would need a bit more investigation. But everyone was concerned about opportunities for young people um, and lighting emerged as well as water pumping as one of the services that would best meet their perceived needs because with lighting they could also sell more things in the evening they were interested in having an evening market for example so lighting as a service would help with all kinds of capability um, again i'm not going to go into this in detail but based on those discussions the engineers and the team were then able to design some different kinds of options for solutions that would have helped people with their priorities some of it based on water pumping, but as I mentioned, that would need further investigation regarding the quality of the water supply. But I think more realistically, options for using solar PV to either generally increase the amount of available electricity to supply the town and lower their costs, but perhaps more interestingly, um, installing so solar PV on a central building could have helped with, for example, the church issues that, that I talked about, so both religious practice and all kinds of social things, and could have supplied electricity as well to, to a certain amount of housing in the neighbourhoods, and could have supplied some street lighting. So many ways in which that could have met some of the capability issues that I mentioned. All of these things would need further investigation in terms of practicalities, ability to, to provide maintenance and regulatory issues. But these were the kinds of designs that we could have put to the community. What we'd have liked to do with further funding was to explore these options further and actually to try some of these interventions. But unfortunately, we haven't so far been able to get further funding to actually make these kinds of interventions concrete. But just to conclude on that case study then and thinking about how the capability approach is, is helpful and advantageous there. So it gave us, I think, a clearer sense of how energy services relate to central and basic capabilities. Clearly the method allowed us to design some interventions that were related to capability enhancement. But I think what's really important is that these interventions are then sensitive to the local context and what people thought that they needed and the kinds of energy services that they used and what they used them for. And these would have addressed a range of individual level capabilities, but also clearly community capabilities like these community events that I talked about and, you know, very important with community cohesion. And I think it's clear that the methods, these discussion groups took things in a different direction from the direction that things would have gone in if they'd only talked to, to local leaders. So there had been some initial discussion with local leaders, which did come up with some ideas, but the ideas that came about through the analysis of the discussion groups were actually quite different, so it's quite helpful to know that. But there are methodological interventions here as well. So with limited time, we didn't, um, the limitations being that we didn't debate what the important capabilities are, we did go in with that list that was derived from this band's list. The difficulty of prioritization that I've already mentioned, Asking people about their aspirations, I think inevitably their aspirations are, are fairly limited to things that are close to their current experience. That's not surprising, but it's also fairly realistic actually in terms of what a, an intervention might be able to achieve. Over time, you would help that then people's situation would change, their aspirations might change, and you know, a process over time of, of development could happen in this way. Um, also, the, the limitation that even when we've based this on the community's assessment of their needs, there are issues that we might not always be able to meet those priorities. And, and I think the water issue was especially an issue here and that would have needed further discussion with the community. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to a, a, a second example. And this is using a slightly different approach and that this is an example from India with a different collaborator, Ewan Malakar. And in this example, we, what we actually did was, was secondary analysis of qualitative data. So the data itself wasn't collected on the basis of capabilities, but we used a, a, a sort of quantitative qualitative technique that I'm going to explain now. Um, so this data, it was collected in four rural villages in, in southern India and in Andhra Pradesh. And these villages, on the one hand, there were two villages that were primarily using firewood to cook, two villages that were using liquid petroleum gas. 
So basically the second two villages had gone through a transition from using biomass to, to cleaner cooking fuels. The first two villages hadn't, but they were comparable villages in other ways. So they were villages that were primarily agricultural livelihoods and most of them, most of all households would be classified as being below the poverty line. So there were 10 focus groups involving 70 women in total. This was just with women. Um, and the focus groups talked about their energy situation in various ways, not at the time, basically around the capability approach. But what we did was then to apply the capability approach analytically. So we read the transcripts multiple times. From the transcripts, we identified passages that were associated with fuel use and the outcomes that we could associate with energy, any of Nussbaum's central capabilities. And then this is where the sort of quantification came in, because any any reference that indicated a positive relationship between energy fuel and a capability was scored plus one, and any mention that indicated a negative relationship was scored minus one. And we did this independently, two of us. We then checked to see whether we um, whether we came up with this with the same analysis. We had quite a high match, and then we just discussed to resolve any differences. So with that quantification. Um, I'm just going to represent this, going to talk through this um, represented in graphical form, just quite simple bar charts. So, so this indicates what the, the firewood, so the two villages that use firewood, these were the connections that they made between their fuel use and capabilities, and they were asked about both firewood and LPG. So current firewood users, and interestingly, you can see straight away, so this is the negative connections. So the firewood users quite clearly made negative connections. They've many mentions of having a negative connection with the capability of body health. So they basically they knew firewood was bad for their health. But more interestingly, there were quite a lot of positive connections with affiliation. And what this was about was on the one hand, they talked about carrying on tradition. So it was important to their community to carry on a tradition of how they've always done things. But also interestingly, Collecting firewood was good for relationships because it was a communal activity. So they went with friends and relatives to the forest to collect firewood, and it was a time that they talked to each other, they discussed their problems, and you know, it was it's a time that social capital and social capital and personal relationships were built and maintained. Um, this one, census imagination and thought, that really relates to people talking about how firewood was it produces really tasty food. People like the taste of food with firewood. Um, and also because it's free and cheap, then this real environment. Interestingly, the firewood users did not see any positive connections between LPG and capabilities. So they expected the AP LPG use would be bad for their capabilities in many ways. Um, so they actually thought it would be bad for their health in terms that they believe that food cooked with LPG is not healthy. Um, in terms of affiliation, that it was bad for relationships because it would stress the, the financial aspects would stress their marital relationships. And food cooked on LPG tastes bad as well. So that's the final one there. And just, just some quotations to illustrate with that. Um, food being cooked with firewood is not just tasty, but also healthy. They thought, they thought that LPG causes health problems. They talked about traditions being really important for community cohesion. So that's, that's the affiliation capability there. But if we look at what LPG users said, so quite different. So they'd previously been firewood users, but, but they'd moved to using LPG. So here, mainly negative connections between firewood and capabilities. Um, again, bad for health. They just thought that firewood was still positive in terms of, of tasty food. So the senses capability there, but otherwise generally felt that using firewood was not good for them a lot of positive connections between LPG and capabilities. So LPG here is actually seen very good for affiliation. And this is partly because of improved social status. Um, so using LPG was, was considered to, to make you look good in the community, but also it helped them care for their children and care for their family members, mostly because of the time saved. So because they didn't spend so much time cooking, it meant that children got to school on time more often. If relatives came around, they could quickly prepare some tea and some snacks. So all of these things were good for relationships. LP considered good for health. Um, control of the environment actually gave them money making opportunities 
because they saved time and they could use that time to do other things and they were exercising their choice and agency. Um, and again, just a few quotations to illustrate that. Lots of good points about LPG in various ways. But unfortunately, still believing that firewood is still better for the taste of food. So some things that we can observe from that is that, so we can see that, so firewood users on the one hand, firewood users, it's important to see that they really believe that firewood contributes to their well-being. And this really perhaps helps to explain some of the difficulties that people have in making that transition. So despite being aware and having high awareness of health impacts, it's useful to see how it contributed to their, their well-being in other ways. Before LPG adoption, didn't really see the benefits of that, but after LPG adoption, interesting to see that actually some of the benefits of firewood that had been seen before were no longer seen as actually so important. They were no longer worried about losing the affiliation capabilities there. And quite a lot of the concerns about LPG seem to have been mitigated. But we could also see that quite a lot of the benefits of LPG were indirect. They were actually due to the time that had been saved rather than a direct um, benefit of LPG per se. So again, we can sort of referring back to those relationships on the diagram there. Um, we can see that the capabilities, so the resources, and I put actually time and money here, energy, time and money, all as resources. So having the improved capabilities from using LPG rather than firewood actually meant that they had more time as the resource. Um, and actually potentially more money because they could use that time to earn more money. So capabilities are feeding back to resources there in quite positive ways and capabilities also are helping in the ways that they can convert time and money into further capabilities. So an interesting kind of virtual cycle kind of got set up there once they realized this full transition. So again, just thinking about the how the capability approach has helped us there and what, what it's helped to see that we might not have otherwise seen. We can see the more complicated relationships between fuel use and well-being that maybe explain some of the resistance to transition that quite often frustrates policy makers and NGOs. We can see this recursive relationship between resources, capabilities and conversion factors. We can see, interestingly, that these relationships change with experience. So they're not fixed once people make a move, they can actually reassess the, the, how they see the relationship between fuel and what they can do and be. And then this led us to make a couple of recommendations. So first of all, we could see how the capabilities that firewood enables and how, how the capabilities that firewood supports, how they can be supported by other means so that people, when they're giving up their firewood use, don't feel that they're also giving up those capabilities. We can actually, you know, perhaps reassure people and build in other ways to make sure that they're affiliation that their relationships that their time spent doing things together might still be done in other ways without having to collect firewood for that to happen and another recommendation is is that given that the lpg users have gone through this transition that it might be useful to think about peer learning programs so people who've gone through that transition and use lpg can become people who educate others in the benefits of lpg to try to to, to kind of reassure and explain how some of these opportunities actually open up that might not have been seen beforehand. Again, some limitations, methodological limitations and issues with using the approach here. Using this sort of method of quantifying qualitative data. It's useful, it's interesting, but it's limited in that maybe, you know, the number of times something mentioned is mentioned isn't necessarily a proxy for how important it is. It's important to bear that in mind. It's, it's an interesting observation, but numbers of mentions is not per se important. And then again, because of using um, the NUSBAM list analytically, we didn't have a full sense of the capabilities that were most important to the community, or indeed whether there are any other things that, that we've missed that, that could have been important to the community. So, so the usual limitations there of using the, the predefined list rather than a, a list that's been developed in collaboration with the community. I just will mention one more thing before I come to an end here, because I, I've been talking for quite a while, but I just want to mention a project that we're working on currently. Um, and this is the Horizon 2020 project that Ica mentioned at the beginning that we're working on community energy for energy solidarity. And this is the project working with energy communities across Europe about developing good practice for addressing in household energy poverty. 
but it's it's based on solidarity mechanisms. So they've all got mechanisms within within their energy communities which draw on collective action in various forms. And the project's really about peer learning, so how energy communities can, can inform each other, how we can spread these practices from one community to another and trial them in a different context. And our role as researchers is to evaluate the impacts of these mechanisms of these energy solidarity interventions. So the impacts on households, but also the impacts on the energy communities themselves and on trainees who are working on these and on the wider sets of stakeholders. Um, so just as an example, this is one of our energy communities. Um, this is Green Energy Cooperative in Zagreb in Croatia. And they, um, their energy solidarity scheme intervention is that they um, collected money from individuals, but also local businesses and local companies. And the funds that they've collected are funding energy saving kits. Um, so basic energy efficiency kits, which are specifically for older people. So they're, they're, they've, they've got funding for, I think it's 111 kits, as it says there. And they're distributing these to older person households. In the in Zagreb, in the in the neighbourhoods in which they work, um, but they're also training underemployed young people as energy advisors who will help households to install these kits, but also give advice about energy efficiency and advice about available funding and so on. So it's helping both the household, but it's also helping more widely in the community. It's helping volunteers. It's helping energy advisors to gain skills. So what we want to do in our evaluation is is to use a capabilities based kind of evaluation rather than the standard metrics of energy poverty about ability to keep warm or, or energy bills. And in this case, we're doing it quantitatively through a survey, which, which I have to say is challenging. So we developed a before and after survey for households and we've got questions around their capabilities and the extent to which their capabilities are compromised. Um, so we've had a lot of back and forth with partners about what, what's appropriate to ask people about and what would work. So we're asking people about these dimensions, about physical and mental health, ability to study, relationships, their feelings of dignity, safety and security, access to services and the play capability, recreation and so on. So at the moment, I'd hoped by now to actually have um, some results else to talk about but we're, we're not quite there yet with the project so that, that's work in progress but if you're interested in following this then you can look at the project. Um, so I think the advantage of the approach there we're mobilizing capabilities based definition of energy poverty obviously impacts on the household so it's a wider range of impacts that we're interested in than standard approaches to energy poverty would use but apart from the impacts of the household what we're also really interested in are the capabilities capabilities of wider sets of people there, the trainees and the stakeholders. So the idea of these interventions is that, is that they produce more than just relieving energy poverty of households, but they produce um, yeah, capability improvements and advantages for, for wider constituencies. And this is the solidarity aspect of it. So we can think of solidarity in, in capabilities terms, perhaps that's, that's what we're kind of working on. And methodologically, the survey is pragmatic. It's a relatively quick and efficient method. We can translate it into different languages. We can mobilize it across um, different countries that we're working in. But as usual, limitations. So, you know, the, com the questions are a little bit complicated. It's not entirely straightforward to administer. It's better when an energy advisor can, can administer to that with a household. It's harder when it's a self-completion survey, as it is in some circumstances. It's still focused on affordability. Um, rather than other aspects. But I think in the European context, that's actually okay because energy poverty is mainly an affordability issue, so that's appropriate. We've needed to focus on a limited set of impacts, but nevertheless, it's still a wider set of impacts. It's still more multidimensional than the usual measures. And we're going to have challenges with the before and after measures to the extent that which we can attribute that to the effects of the interventions, but these, these are all challenges that we'll have to work within our analysis. So really to conclude my talk there, after um, quite a lot of talking through some different examples, hopefully that's been interesting. So just, just to really kind of summarise what I, I hope to have got across today. So hopefully I might have convinced you that the capability approach provides an effective way of conceptualising energy poverty and it's got some advantages over standard approaches. The main advantage is the IC being the multidimensionality of it, the way that energy can be seen to relate to 
a wider set of capabilities and a wider set of dimensions of eudaimonic well-being. It allows us to pay attention to individual diversity or, or inequalities between groups of people. As a geographer, what I really like about it is that it's context sensitive, so we can really see how energy services and capabilities relate to each other in very specific geographical and social contexts. And those, you know, as you've seen from the examples, these, these can be quite different. And the nuances of how energy is used and what it's used for in different places and how that supports people can be very different. Um, it provides better connections with wider theories of poverty and development. And it gives us, although we haven't used this in my examples, I think a, a good feature is that it gives us the space to think about substitutes for energy that support capabilities and not necessarily rely on energy per se. Notwithstanding some challenges which are definitely there, I think we, we have effectively explored some ways in which the approach can be mobilised through qualitative and quantitative methods. And I think, I hope that it can provide helpful, practical and people-centred insights and design ideas. So I'm going to finish there. Thank you for listening. Just some references that I mentioned in the talk. I'm very happy for anyone to contact me for more information or for interesting discussions about all of this. Um, so over to the discussion now, I think.